Federation FIP and the FIP Technology Advisory Group. Next slide. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lars Åke Söderlund, and I have the honor and pleasure of moderating this event today, together with my colleague and co-chair of the FIP Technology Advisory Group, Jaime Acosta Gomez. I am one of the FIP's vice presidents and also co-chairing this uh, advisory group, the technology advisory group together with Jaime. Over to you, Jaime. Thank you, Lars. Okay. Um, thank you for the, uh, uh, thank you all for being with us today for this, I think, very important event. My name is Jaime, uh, Jamie, if you prefer. I'm a practicing community pharmacist that uh, is currently serving at the FIP as professional secretary of the community pharmacy section and having the honor of co-chairing the FIP technology advisory group with uh, my dear friend, Lars Oak. Over back to you, Lars Oak. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, this webinar or this digital event is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. And the recording will be available on our website, www.eventsfip.org. And you may ask questions using the question uh, box provided. Please don't post questions in the chat box, only in the Q&A box. And of course, we welcome you to give us feedback on this event because your feedback will help us improve our uh, events for the future. And I also advise you to become a member of FIP and you can join at our website. And I think that joining FIP might be one of the best investments you can ever make because together we are stronger when transforming healthcare and pharmacy for the future. So let's look into today's program. Today, we will learn about the FIP Technology Advisory Group, as well as the FIP Resources on Technology. We will hear about digital services within the community pharmacy and benefits of technology in hospital pharmacy. And of course, we will hear uh, very interesting news about the value of health apps, as well as is digital education the first step in development of digitally enabled pharmacists? And finally, considerations for artificial intelligence in pharmacy. Next slide, please. The learning objectives of today's event is to get to know the FIP Technology Advisory Group and to get insight to the FIP resources on digital health, but also to learn about the digital development of pharmacy practice in different settings post COVID. And of course, also create interest for you to attend the FIP World Congress of Pharmacy in Brisbane, where we will talk a lot about digital health and digital pharmacy for the future. Next slide, please. Well, uh, before we continue, I would like to uh, start by focusing on the FIP development goal number 20, digital health, which is the foundation of FIP technology agenda. Next slide, please. The FIP development goal 20, digital health, includes three elements of workforce and education, practice and science. The workforce and education element sets a goal for countries to have enablers of digital transformation within the pharmacy workforce and effective processes to facilitate the development of digital literate pharmaceutical workforce. The practice element sets a goal for countries to have systems and structures in place to develop and deliver quality digital health and pharmaceutical care services through digital literacy and utilization of technology and digital enablers configuration of responsive digital services to widen access and equity. And the science element sets a goal for countries to have application of digital technology in healthcare delivery and development of the innovation, innovative um, medical products. And in the next slide, FIP recommends mechanisms to support countries in implementing each element of the development goal number 20. Some of the mechanisms to implement the workforce and education element of these goals are to develop courses, training, material, and experiential learning opportunities in initial education and early career training to prepare a digitally literate workforce and to incorporate 
digital health and literacy competences and skills in pharmaceutical competency, advanced and specialist frameworks, etc. And in the next slide, we can see here some of the mechanisms to implement the practice element of this digital health goal. To demonstrate digital literacy and understanding of governance issues surrounding data ownership, ethics, privacy, quality information, and have policies in place to support the development of the workforce as managers of health data. And to recognize digital health as a mechanism for widening access and equity, including access to digital pharmaceutical care. And in the next slide, some of the mechanisms to implement the science element of the digital health goal are to promote the use of and interpretation of digital technology and information during training and education of pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists, and to enable integration of data science solutions to improve patient care. And also the WHO's agenda for sustainable development highlights that the spread of information and communications technology and global interconnectedness has a great potential to accelerate human progress, to bridge the digital divide and to develop knowledge societies. And with the recognition that information and communications technologies present new opportunities and challenges for the achievement of all 17 sustainable development goals. There is a growing consensus in the global health community that the strategic and innovative use of digital and cutting edge information and communication technologies will be an essential enabling factor towards ensuring that one billion people, one billion more people benefit from universal health coverage that 1 billion more people are better protected from health emergencies, and that 1 billion more people enjoy better health and well being. And that is WHO's triple billion target. So, by that, I think it's time to look and present, uh, look to and present our experts today Mr. Jaime Acosta Gomez from Spain, Paul Fahey from Ireland, Mr. Robert Moss from the Netherlands. Uh, Mrs. Natasha Jovanovic Leskovic from Serbia, uh, Claudia Rickin from the Netherlands, and Whitley Yi from USA. And by this, it's an honor and pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Mr. Jaime Acosta Gomez from Spain, co chair of the FAP Technology Advisory Group, as well as professional secretary of the Community Pharmacy Section within FAP. Welcome, Jaime. Thank you. Thank you again, Lars Hoke. So, it is uh, my pleasure to be here with you with all these expert speakers and it's uh, my objective for, for today to introduce you uh, to one of the, I think, very important branches, uh, constituencies in the FIP, which is the Technology Advisory Group. Uh, so I will share today with you some of the resources that uh, uh, most of them open also for non-members, uh, which I think it's, is going to be interesting for you uh, if you are interested in technology. So I will just briefly present them and uh, briefly introduce you to the um, technology advisory group and some very exciting news that, that we have. So in the next slide, um, I will start uh, by introducing you to the technology advisory group. It's uh, uh, a group uh, developed internally by the FIP that brings together health technology experts uh, within FIP membership to exchange views on current, current activities uh, problem areas, best practice, emerging trends and, te and technologies, etc. It's the role of the FIP Technology Advisory Group to provide technical expertise when needed and work together on joint product projects with other um, FIP constituencies and member organizations that add value and are aligned with the FIP strategic plan. In the next slide, uh, you can see the, um, the uh, scope of uh, the technology advisory group. Uh, we are uh, very much interested in digital trends in pharmacy and healthcare, uh, healthcare as a whole, being in pharmacy a very important actor uh, in healthcare, which is becoming more and more important, especially after COVID. Uh, the advancements in digital uses of medical devices and di digital therapeutics, how uh, pharmacy teams are going to be better placed to uh, support patients uh, when there's really too much noise in healthcare for them. Uh, we uh, are very interested 
in market disruptors and uh, how uh, pharmacy, healthcare, and patients uh, may benefit from them. Uh, so uh, we are having a very positive approach uh, to change and to disruption, uh, only if it's in the benefit of patients and it brings better outcomes, more efficiency, um, more convenience for patients as uh, uh, some technology tools um, offer. So uh, we are also involved in uh, supporting pharmacy education, pharmacy practice, and pharmaceutical science by using uh, technology, not only uh, new technology, but also technology that is already at hand. Uh, we are very interested in the impact of mobile health and wearable technology, uh, having the patients uh, permanently monitored and uh, uh, letting healthcare be a continuous flow in the back of the patient, uh, it working seamlessly, uh, changing how healthcare is being delivered from buildings to the screens and devices that patients uh, wear or take with them. Of course, uh, interoperability standards and terminologies are very important. I will only highlight the importance of interoperability in terms of uh, taking pharmacy out of its current analogic silo, uh, not only community pharmacy, but also sometimes hospital pharmacy and other practice settings. Uh, that's very important and technology brings the solution for that. Uh, of course, uh, best practices and standards and the use of artificial intelligence will have uh, speakers uh, much more expert than me, of course, up to me, and I, will get, uh, I won't get into the details of this. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some uh, uh, developments from the FIP. All of them are um, uh, the, uh, open for you. And I'm referring to the reports that are in the lower part of the screen. Uh, uh, E-health, mobile health on your left in the center, I think what is a, a very important report uh, first in, it, in its class, trying to assess how digital health is being taught in pharmacy schools. And uh, I, I I'm very interested also in the um, uh, search, the research that uh, the FIP did in terms of how digital health tools are currently being used in practice. Uh, I think it's a very interesting report. And uh, on your right, the online pharmacy operations and distribution of medicines report uh, developed by the community pharmacy section, heavily focused on technology, of course, uh, not only focused on uh, the logistic part of how uh, online pharmacies are operating in different parts of the world, but also in terms of digital health services, what digital health services those online pharmacies are offering to, to patients to provide, um, to provide uh, better outcomes of, of medicines, a more convenient service, uh, et cetera. And uh, this is not something new for the FIP. Uh, the FIP has for a long time been interested in, in technology uh, much, much before the uh, the expert, the technology expert uh, group uh, was was uh, in place, and you have some uh, webinars available for you uh, at the webpage uh, with many other uh, resources in form of, of webinars. I think they are very, very good. We have very good experts that participate very happily with the FIP and offer their expertise. Uh, for you. So if you're interested in, in checking the website as offered in the QR code, you're more than welcome. You are going to like it, I think. In the next slide, <clears throat> um, it's my pleasure also to uh, um, uh, bring you uh, this uh, second edition that will be uh, sure finished uh, before the Brisbane FIP World Congress. The first edition, again, was uh, first in class. I highly recommend you reading the Pharmaceutical Care and Digital Revolution if you are interested in, in uh, the digital health in specific uh, pharmacy uh, practice and developing development of digital health tools uh, in the pharmacy uh, area. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to say, and we have Claudia Ricken with us today, who's one of the leads of, of the uh, second edition that will be ready for you. In, in Brisbane, uh, and I'm sure she will uh, talk uh, at least briefly about, about the book in, in her presentation after me. In the next slide, uh, this is uh, the latest uh, development uh, about technology from the FIP, a very recent uh, report from a roundtable that many 
of us uh, who are with you today, uh, again, very happily participated. You have the QR code available, but this one is available only for FIP members as a, as a privilege to our, to our membership. I think it's a very good report. Uh, in the next slide, uh, this is another resource which is also available for FIP members, which is currently being redeveloped. But uh, we are very much concerned about how digital health, uh, not concerned, but uh, the concern is not the right word. Uh, but I think uh, we, we need to support uh, pharmacy schools to, to uh, provide better equip the pharmacists of the future with digital health resources. So we're trying to provide uh, an improvement uh, in, in pharmacy degrees, and we are trying to uh, support uh, pharmacy educators in terms of providing digital health uh, and knowledge to, to pharmacy students. In the uh, next slide, this is something which is very exciting for the technology advisory group. Uh, very recently, we opened uh, three, three vacancies uh, for the term of 2023 to 2025. Uh, so if you are interested in being part of the technology advisory group, this is the moment for you. Uh, you have, again, a QR code uh, where you uh, can access all the information. Uh, you would need to be uh, an FIP individual member uh, uh, or an affiliated person with an FIP member organization. You would need to, of course, uh, fill some information for the uh, technology advisory group to check your nomination, especially uh, uh, a statement from you and a recent uh, short uh, biography. So uh, after the 7th of March, uh, uh, we will have uh, new members in the technology advisory group and we would be super excited uh, to have your request to participate. So in the next slide, just a quote that I love, uh, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds, exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. That's something I try to apply to my pharmacy and to everything I do and I think it's a, it's a very nice quote. So it is my, my pleasure to introduce you uh, in the next slide to uh, Paul Fohey. Uh, he's a member of the FIP Technology Advisory Group and um, his company is Glenach uh, Consulting, Consulting Limited uh, from Ireland. Uh, thank you, Paul, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Jaime. Um, if we can get to, to the next slide, please. And um, just a little background about myself. I'm a community pharmacist with a health informatics background, but the, um, the other information you'll be able to see in the playback. We've a uh, very limited time today. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so when we talk about digital health, we um, what do we really mean? And I, I came across this really interesting definition, which it says it refers to the use of information and communication technologies in medicines and other health professions to manage, prevent, treat illness, and to promote wellness. So it's how we use information and how we pass it on to each other, really. And traditionally, we were all, some of us in my generation, we were more raised on paper storage of information. And nowadays, we're moving, we're digitizing our information, which means we're moving it from a paper format to a technology platform. And that is a very much an operational focus is what we do every day in our work. And then when we do that, after we've digitized the information, we move on to digital transformation, where we can use the information because it's easier to access and to transform the business models that we have to give a better focus on how we deliver and what we deliver and we deliver faster, cheaper, better. So our customers are more satisfied and we are more satisfied. And then moving on from digital transformation, that allows us to develop artificial intelligence because we're building up big banks of data. But Whitley will tell you more about that later in her presentation. But if you go to the next slide, please. So why does digital health matter? And it's something, it's very important to go back to basics to realize why do we do what we do? And I think basically digital health, it improves accuracy because we can constrain the information that we can put into a system. So we can say it can only be alpha characters or it can only be numeric characters, depending on the fields or a mixture of both. But we can check the length of the field, we can check the contents of the field, uh, we can check the language that's used. So we can force integrity of information at that input so that we don't have bad handwriting being an issue going forward. So the information is there in a clear, concise, accurate form. And once we have that information and we build up banks of information, um, then we can 
use it. We can type in searches to retrieve information. So say, look up all the polls that are in Ireland. That would probably bring up an awful lot of information, but at least we can do it. And then we can refine the search by surname, by date of birth, everything. So once we have this information digitally, we can search and it gives us more powerful use of the information that we have, something that we couldn't do very easily with paper. So once we have the information in certain formats, we can then reduce our costs because it's less time, but we can in in increase security as well because in an awful lot of cases, paper files can be left open. That, that would you know, al allow for privacy to be breached. Uh, paper can be lost, paper can be burnt, it can be, you know, it can be damaged through fire, through getting wet. Um, but when, once we have it in a digital format, we can form backups of the information. So it's more secure. We can restrict access, you know, by username and passwords and, and second factor authentication, etc. So it, it increases the security of the information, increases the privacy. And then once we have the information in on a system, we can move it to other systems through email or through uh, secure information exchange, so through the use of portals or through secure email like we have in Ireland. Um, and that means that we can transfer information so patient, the information can move with the patient rather than us having to give a big file of information every time. Um, and that leads to improved professional collaboration, interprofessional collaboration, so between hospitals and community pharmacies, between doctors and pharmacies, uh, from secondary care to tertiary care, et cetera. So, and for nursing home care, it's a huge issue as well. So if we can improve that and we can move information more accurately and safely, that increases the actual, the benefits for the patient and the accuracy. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So there's an awful lot of jargon used uh, in digital health, and I've just put this up here. I'm not going to dwell too long on it, but I mean, the ones really to look out for there are cloud computing. It just means that the the the, the software is not running on your computer. It's on a web-based application. In other words, it's running on a computer uh, somewhere else, it's usually in a data center. Uh, E-health, in general, refused to any electronic process and the internet. M-health is a subdivision of that where we're using mobile devices. Digital therapeutics is a new area, which I will talk about later. Uh, gamification is just a means of how we develop applications. So we involve the user uh, earlier on in the process of actually designing the software. So we, we, it's as if we're playing games with the software. Um, interoperability is probably one of the most critical issues that we have um, at the moment. And that is that we need the information that we store in our computer. When we transfer it to another computer, that computer knows what that information is and knows how to use it. So it's meaningful use of information and meaningful transfer of information um, and the com how computers can interpret the information accurately. Uh, connected health, health means the use of several sources um, of health technology. So you might have uh, lab information coming from a lab. You might have clinical decision support um, information on your computer, like drug interactions. You might have um, real world data coming from apps. So connected health brings it all together so we can make better decisions on behalf of the pa patient. Big data, again, ref refers to, leads on to artificial intelligence, which just means large data sets are analyzed computationally to look for trends and patterns and associations and how we can use that to predict outcomes going forward. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So just looking on for those definitions, I've just mapped some examples of how these are used in the community pharmacy setting. So a health technology, information technology program, for example, would be our patient medication record system, the computer we use in the pharmacy. An electronic patient record is the actual record generated by that system. And e-health would be moving prescriptions from the GP surgery to the pharmacy. Another example of e-health would be the summary care records that are in certain jurisdictions. Um, some, some examples I have in France, you have the dossier pharmaceutique. In Australia, I understand you have the personal um, care electronic health re record and my health record in New Zealand and Alberta and Estonia as well has um, records. But a lot of countries now are developing these summary care records where they have very accurate, up-to-date information about the patient's health held on a portal that can be accessed by the various health professionals in, in various settings. And you would have information on demographics, age, sex, um, 
et cetera, and then address. And then you would also have information on medication, on disease status, on allergies, et cetera. It just allows at the point of care that patients would have the information and professionals would have the information. So those barriers to care are removed. So the information moves with the patient rather than the other way around. Um, telehealth and telemedicine would mean providing healthcare at a distance. So an example of that would be live consultations that we had during COVID um, that many pharmacists would have used and GPs would have used. And precision and personalised medicine would relate to, say, personalised medicine would relate to how we personalise the, med, med, the service we provide for the, the patient in front of us. So, for example, you would cert, some pharmacies have clinical decision support systems to support drug interaction checking in their pharmacies. So that is personalised medicine. And then you would also have precision, precision medicine, which is more um, a hospital focus, I would think, at the moment, because there is um, that would be more to do with um, pharmacogenetics. But it's, it is becoming... Um, prevalent in community pharmacy to a certain extent where we now know that people with a certain genotype will treat drugs differently or drugs will react differently in people with certain genotypes, say with cholesterol drugs um, uh, and, and also um, antipsychotic medications. Some people with certain genotypes will react differently. So going forward, we'll be able to pinpoint care better for those patients going forward. E-commerce would refer to the online sale of medicines where it is permitted. Um, it also would be in relation to the reimbursement and remuneration systems that we use uh, <clears throat> to get paid for the services we provide. M Health would be in relation to the use of wearables, where you would have, um, say, blood glucose monitoring taking place. Uh, and then apps in general is a huge area, and Claudia will, will touch on that. But um, I'll have some information uh, a bit later in a more, more uh, community setting, and I'll show you some examples later. So if I could have the next slide again, please. So there was huge disruption due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I just saw this graph in The Economist there from December 2020. And it just showed in the last six months how people have moved to manage their prescriptions online from, say, 16% to about 26%. Uh, check symptoms online moved from 15% up to about 23%. Managed their medical appointments online. So it just showed that, that there was a very big shift. But what I think is important here as well is You've still only 25% of people managing their prescription medicines online. That means 75% are not. So although we are digitizing and the, the pandemic did accelerate it, there is a sign that people do prefer the pers personal service. I, I was surprised at that graph because I thought everything would have shifted more to the right, but it hadn't. So, but you, we have seen the increased use of pharmacy apps uh, in pharmacy during the COVID pandemic, say ordering prescriptions, click and collect, um, then there was the increased use of e-prescribing and electronic transfer of prescriptions from, from, from the prescribers to the pharmacies. In Ireland, we've been waiting 20 years for an electronic transfer of prescription system, and it suddenly happened overnight. So, I mean, <laughs> necessity is the mother of invention in an awful lot of cases. Uh, then you saw digital solutions to help us to provide scheduling and pre-vaccination screening for for flu and for COVID vaccination, so that you would minimize the amount of time that you would the patient and the and the and the pharmacist would be in, in close contact. So all those pre-vaccination questions were done online and checked by the pharmacist before the patient came in. And then we saw an awful lot of integration between our systems and say the government systems or payer systems where you know once we had vaccinated a patient or be it for COVID or for flu, that the actual the vaccine would be registered in our system, but that would also send a message up to the large database, national database, and that allowed for the, the issuance of the COVID certificates. So that really all happened very quickly within a two year period. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> um, then we also had sort of said Paxlovid was being prescribed, you know, and certain other antivirals were being prescribed, but governments and payers wanted to make sure that they were only used under specific categories of patients, say the more vulnerable patients, because you know our financial resources were limited, uh, so there were there were put constraints on who they were prescribed for, how they were prescribed, and then also how they were dispensed. So they set up these these portals where the doctors or the prescribers had to put in the patient details, the reason why they were prescribing. If those reasons weren't uh, met, weren't 
weren't the same as the criteria, then the doctor couldn't prescribe and the pharmacist couldn't dispense. So it was closed loop systems that allowed information to be transferred from the doctor to the payer and then from the payer to the pharmacist saying, yes, it is OK to dispense. And following on from that, we're seeing um, across certain jurisdictions, more restrictions being brought in and risk management programs, say, for valproate and pregnancy. And more recently, GLP-1 agonists are becoming um, the, the glutides, as they call it, uh, which are usually used for diabetes to managing to improve um, blood glucose tolerance in diabetes. An awful lot of them are used now as a weight control measure, which is often on unlicensed restriction. There are products coming out that will be licensed. But at the moment in, in Ireland and in certain jurisdictions, they're not licensed. So governments are trying to restrict how they are prescribed and who they are prescribed to. And then you have share cost schemes as well. But uh, going forward, I think we'll have a policy of cloud only policy for payers. So any new services provided in pharmacy will have to be on the basis of the information is going to be generated in the pharmacy will have to be put into the cloud, not held only on the pharmacy system. So that, that was an example of the vaccination and the Paxlovid. And then we saw during COVID all the continuing education and CPD activities went online because, of course, we couldn't meet during the pandemic. Uh, the next slide, please. So digital therapeutics is a, a new area. I'm not going to say too much about it, but as Claudia will touch on it, but there will be challenges to it in implementing it um, because payment and reimbursement models haven't really caught up with them. So the actual the actual practice is, is ahead of the actual science and the administrative um, issues. But if you can go to the next slide, please. So other recent innovations, document management systems to help all the mounds of compliance documentation that we have in pharmacies, our protocols, our processes and procedures, service optimization, which is sort of developing quality measures that we can implement in software to make sure that we have optimal outcomes for the patients. And I would advise you to check the Pharmacy Quality Alliance in the USA, which is which is a really good resource on this, but it helps pharmacies maximize the care to patient, but it also helps them maximize the ability to provide services to the patient. And therefore, you know, it augments their income as well. Uh, Sentinel cell systems have been used to um, predict outbreaks of flu and colds and RSV infections. This has happened in Indonesia. There's a link to that paper there, but it also has happened in Portugal as well. So um, this has all been, because we record information on platforms, we can dig down into it and use it as a predictor for things to come. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So um, the recent innovations and developments would be to match the actual IT that we have with the actual practice that we do. So in, in, in community pharmacy in Ireland, there is a pilot going on where there is a, a set of health checks that the pharmacy performs, but they're recorded digitally. And that would help us develop a risk score for patients. So they're seeing that we can move the care of the patient from the hospital down to the GP, and now down to the pharmacy, we can check who's going to be at risk for, say, cardiovascular disease going forward. And that's all based on algorithms used on the software that pharmacies record the results on. Um, there's an awful lot of effort going into sort of trying to promote interoperability, both within countries and across the world. So the International Health Enterprise, which Jacqueline Sorik, who is a former vice president of FIP, is a member of Youth the International Standards also Organization, HL7, SNOMED, to mention a few. Um, then you have securing the supply chain. So the falsified sub substandard medicines in Europe, we have to verify the medicines that we actually dispense and decommission them. Uh, I understand that that's going to be happening in the USA shortly and also in other jur jurisdictions. And then um, in Ghana, interestingly, I put a link here to their uh, national regulator. They have a new system um, for verifying that pharmacies are who they say they are. And it's a really interesting model going forward. But going, going ahead then to the future, um, we have artificial intelligence becoming a huge area. If I have the next slide, please. Um, see, the information age, how we source information is moving online, as I showed earlier as well, how we manage it is moving online. But I mean, that will lead to another question that we have, which the next slide, please, will, um, will show us. Artificial intelligence. So if we're going to be going online, what information are we going to be getting? How are we going to be getting it? Is it going to be from chatbots? Is it going to be from, say, 
chat GPT or other types of um, language processing systems or AI systems, how sure can we be that the information is accurate? Um, but there are some good uses that, that we could be using um, AI in community pharmacy, and well, that would be for billing and reimbursement, reducing the administrative burden and the better clinical decision support. But the next slide, please. So this is just areas that I think AI might be disruptive, both in a in a in a good way and a bad way. There's education, which uh, I think Natasha is going to be talking about later. Um, but there's a risk of bias inherent in. So the top right uh, box there, I would draw your attention to. Not all innovation will bring improvement. There's a risk of bias with AI because it depends on the data sets that are used and the bias that's in them. Inherent bias due to the the actual age, sex uh, profile of the data of the people where the data was taken from. But I think from a pharmacy point of view and community, people will be coming to us to verify the data, the information that they get online more going forward. If have the next slide, please. So the future, I think, as I said earlier, not everybody wants to go online. So I think community pharmacy service is going to be a blend of digital and in-person. Uh, it's going to become more co complex because we're going to have more information coming to us that is going to help us, but also make it more complicated to make decisions on behalf of the patient. Um, we might be using blockchain in the future to, to improve the security of data exchange. And then the rise of the platform, you have a lot of parallel uh, and vertical integration of healthcare providers where the owner and the payer and the provider are the same person, which brings its risks as well. But we'll see what happens in the future. Um, if I have the next slide again, please. So going forward, because certain platforms have been very dominant in the in the in in the both the AI space, but also in the market entry space. So in other words, to have an app, you have to be on a certain platform, and then how you get onto that platform uh, is sort of restricted by the person, the, the company that owns the platform. So the US and the the UK and um, the EU are bringing in legislation. Which is in the Digital Market Act in the in the EU and in the Open App Markets Act in the US to make sure that every there's a fair playing field for everybody who wants to get involved in this area, but also how information is used is going to be, um, is you know, and how digital services are provided are going to be regulated going forward as well. But I think going forward there's going to be a huge opportunity for pharmacists because of the complexity of these areas. They want to know. We, we are the experts in medicines and information for, for patients, and that is going to be a key part of how services are done going forward. So I think there's a huge career opportunity for those of you who are interested in health informatics going forward in pharmacy informatics. And if I have the next slide, please. Finally, just proceed with caution. Um, I've, I've mentioned an awful lot of these things. Our jobs are going to get more complex. AI is going to be there. It might help us. It might hinder us. Uh, beware of big promises. Look up the Tyrannos case in the US. But always, when we're designing new software, we need to involve the people who are going to be implementing the software. So user experience is very important. And gamification comes into that, um, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, our, path, our work pathways will be disrupted going forward, but they always have been, and we will get used to it. Um, as long as it provides better, uh, better care for the patient and a better workflow for us, then I say go for it. Uh, because we're sharing more data, there's more more potential for data breaches. But the future is hybrid, omni-channel. I don't think I think pharmacists are going to be the way of the future and community pharmacy, especially. So with that, I will leave you and thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for a, a very exciting and excellent presentation. Uh thank you. It is time now for me to very gladly introduce you to Robert Moss. Uh, he's a member of the FIP Technology Advisory Group and uh he's part of the exco of the FIP Hospital Pharmacy section. Uh, uh again, I thank uh, all of our speakers today for this very brief introduction. As you can imagine, they have very long and very important bios. They are experts in the field of pharmacy, and uh well, it's a pleasure to to uh have you with us today. So, Rob, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Jaime, for the, the introduction and for having me on this uh, call. Please could I have the next slide. And first of all, no conflicts of interest. And the next slide to start my, I'll just, you should be able to see me. Next slide, please. Um, just generally about the hospital pharmacy section. 
which of course is part of FIP. And last year we published a strategic plan for the next coming years. And next slide, please. Basically is how can we utilize pharmacists' full clinical expertise? And we saw the several emerging trends. One, of course, more patient-centered care, work for sustainability and development. But we also realized technology was really going to change the way we're working. So that is the part that I will be talking about in this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, and it starts with basics, technology and logistics. Of course, we have more and more advanced dispensing cabinets, tracking every medication all the way to the patient and even when it's in the patient. And more advanced technologies are, next slide, please, is using robotics for the distribution within wards. So that is technology at the logistic level. And next slide, please. But still, despite all this technology, medication safety is still a big issue in hospitals. And it might be an overestimation, but one in five administrations are wrong. It's either the wrong patient, but very importantly, wrong medication. Next slide, please. So we've been using closed loop systems, barcode scanning, RFID scanning, to make sure that we get all the parameters right and that it's the right patient getting the right medication. Next slide, please. Yet not in all countries, we have the opportunity of having uh, barcodes for every medication delivered to a patient. So there's now new technology, optical recognition software. You take your medication, put it in this specific machine. Next slide, please. And it scans the medication. Next slide. And doing that, you verify the patient, you verify the medication, and it identifies the tablets, whether it's correct or incorrect, and you can correct it and put it in again and administer it and record it in the healthcare system. So you have a different way of reaching a closed loop system. Next slide, please. It's all about capturing data. That's what we were telling about, creating data and capturing it, identifying, capturing, sharing the data, and then using the data. Next slide, please. A very interesting um, concept is the autonomous pharmacy, which is a development into a more integrated pharmacy information system. As mentioned, moving from paper system to digitized systems, but then to more and more integrated systems. This is several has several levels. Next slide, please. Level one is that what we call the non-autonomous pharmacy. It's disconnected care settings, minimal automation, and data is managed on paper and the pharmacists are heavily engaged in distribution. And what we strive to move to is next slide, please, is a fully autonomous pharmacy where we have fully integrated automated technology across all care settings. And we have automated predictive management processes with each dose tracked. And very importantly, we have data intelligence, full visibility of data, enabling real-time workflow optimization but also predictive intelligence in outcomes. So basically what we're trying to do is replace manual error-prone activities with automated processes that are safer and more efficient. First of all, to reallocate talent to a higher value task and improving the pro provider satisfaction, but most importantly, to improve patient outcomes. And there comes having data intelligence. Next slide, please. So I believe... The, there is going to be a paradigm shift for hospital pharmacists where we work, and I think this holds for all pharmacists, we were, our evidence is based on trials and we make quite static guidelines that we hopefully adhere to. And then there is some expert opinion to either look at it. But next slide, please. There is going to be a big change in the future with all this data being available. We will be able to look at real world outcomes beyond the trials. So hospital pharmacists will be able to offer tailored, uh, tailored specialized pharmaceutical care. Static guidelines will be changed by with short cycle improvement and striving for dynamic guidelines driven by evidence and real patient data. And next, the effort expert opinion will, oh, no, sorry, not the next slide. <laughs> Previous slide, please, if possible. And 
we will, the expert will be helped by artificial intelligence, on which you will hear more later. But the hospital pharmacist will continuously improve the quality of care, making use of digital technologies and artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. So the hospital pharmacist will be a data intelligence officer, or should be a data intelligence officer. Again, starting with the guideline. Next slide, please. We will use the guideline look at the real world data, compare outcomes, evaluate the, the guideline and, and set up a new guide or improve the guideline, optimizing medication use and the outcomes. This is a, will be a truly important role for pharmacists in hospitals, but I also believe in all settings. Next slide, please. And this again will be helped with more into automated systems. Next slide, please. Hospitals as such are very complex organizations, but even within these complex organizations, next slide, there are very high complex environments. A picture on the right here is a neonatal intensive care unit, as you can see, very high complex. And the problem with high complex environments is that there is also a lot of possibility to make errors. Next slide, please. And what we could be, one of the parts of using technology is using virtual reality as a training tool, training medication safety in high complex environments. A beautiful study was published from France in training neonatal intensive care unit nurses. Next slide, please. But besides having a lot of complex or uh, uh, structure there, it also, there is an enormous, a vast amount of data that is being produced in these in complex situations. Next slide, please. And where we want to have the data at the tip of our fingers, anywhere in the hospital, whatever, there is a real true challenge in having a, too much data at a certain point. Next slide, please. So what we will have to do is have your data there, but have intelligent decision support system that will filter the information and then have algorithm that will show it in a context sensitive measure. A stable patient is what it is, a stable patient. It's the patient that needs specific attention when there is some dynamics changing. And this is what software will be helping us with and thus allowing more efficient use of healthcare professionals times, really delivering more care. Next slide, please. One of the roles that hospital pharmacists traditionally have is in therapeutic drug monitoring and optimizing doses. We, in, in a lot of countries, we use individualized Bayesian dose optimization. It's a sophisticated system, next slide please, to predict with the least possible amount of data of, of blood samples, the best possible outcome. And this is what we now offer in uh, multidisciplinary um, rounds that we're running, but there will be artificial intelligence. And the next slide, please. And the role of the pharmacist will change or, because algorithm will calculate the optimal, optimal dose and send it straight to the smart infusion pump. And thus the real-time flow rate will be adjusted and it will be recorded in the electronic health record. These are developments that we really have to take care of and think of that are coming at us and, and rethink our role as, as pharmacists. Next slide, please. It was mentioned personalized medicine. More and more, we will use diagnostics and genomic data to separate patients into different groups and then dose in on individual patients' needs, predicted uh, responses and disease conditions. Next slide. And we will have medication with personal optimized doses. This is a, a, an example of 3D printing in the Netherlands. Next slide, please where two drugs that are, not, that are not available in in many combinations, they are now current liquid or fixed high dose combinations. With 3D printing, you can combine different doses exactly tailored to the individual pediatric patient in this case. Next slide. Or you could even make it slightly more attractive to take than the left-handed pill. You can make it little shapes. But this, of course, is just an added little value. Next slide, please. What really is going to change is the way that healthcare is being delivered. The preferred state of everybody would be healthy. But our healthcare, next slide, please, is very much concentrated on the right-hand side of this slide. When people are already at high risk, 
going into chronic disease progression and having acute cares, intensive care or acute diseases, and then running into hospitals. That is where our money is being spent on expensive hospital care. What we should be doing is shifting the, the, um, the predictors at the left-hand side. Next slide, please. We should move from sick care, which it actually is at this point, to health care, identifying people at risk. And for that, uh, next slide, please. There will be a change. People do not, will not have to come to hospitals. We have to look at an earlier stage before the, prog the progression is uh, getting worse and worse and people need to be hospitalized. Next slide, please. So there'll be intermediate uh, practices, specialized centers or specialized care at home. Next slide. And telehealth, it was mentioned before for community pharmacies, but also hospital pharmacies will greatly add, help this. And to get the right data at the right space. Next slide, please. We will also be making use of point of care testing and M Health technology at the patient home, giving enough information to the doctor or the pharmacist to give the care that is needed wherever it is the patient is at that point. Next slide, please. So these are what we will need is health system components that are linked in health systems as it is, but it will be. Uh, augmented with, next slide please, data produced by patients, by wearables, by uh, internet of things, but also medical devices that can be stirred, uh, that can be triggered at, from home or monitored from home. And again, it was mentioned interoperability is crucial. Designing systems now need to be interoperable with these developments. Next slide please. So first of all, the different health systems, there will be different health systems and they have to be linked, but I think care will be de defined in a different way. Next slide, please. Patients will not be in one specific health system. Next slide, please. Care will be developed and, and will be organized within networks. There might be a urology network or a Parkinson network, a diabetes network. And so patients will not come to a certain health system, but will be at the places that are best for them. A diabetes would be best in a diabetes network, having themselves, but also, next slide, please. Having healthcare pay, uh, providers focusing on the patient as central in that network, but, next slide, please, making sure that the, ta ca the, the care is tailor-made so giving it in the right setting, having the right care provider in that setting, but also having the right information available in uh, at the point of care or with the, the patient, and thus truly having a patient-oriented pharmaceutical care. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention for this broad overview of what I think will be hospital pharmacy's future. Thank you, Rob, for an excellent and very clear presentation on the benefits uh, that technology brings to uh, healthcare, but specifically to hospital uh, pharmacy uh, uh, care. So thank you so much. It's time now for Claudia Ricken, who's a dear friend. Uh, she's a member of the FIP Technology Advisory Group and is leading, uh, uh, I think, a very interesting initiative uh, company called Farmy in the Netherlands. So she is actually changing healthcare by my doing. So thank you, Claudia. The, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Jaime, and thanks for the opportunity to share uh, something about the value of health apps. Yeah, I'm Claudia. I'm um, uh, a pharmacist, indeed founder of a digital pharmaceutical care startup in the Netherlands. And I'm also a lecturer at the University of Utrecht um, teaching digital pharmaceutical care to master students pharmacy. And I have no uh, conflicts of interests. Can I go to the next slide? Yeah, um, let's, uh, some of the things that, um, that I'm going to explain have been um, uh, touched upon before by the previous speakers, but let's have a look at the broader perspective of what's happening in our world. Um, if you look at pharmaceutical care, um, you see that in many countries, uh, the capacity, and that's the left side of the, uh, the, the graph, the capacity in educated uh, pharmacy personal is fast decreasing. It's not in every uh, country the same, but quite a number of countries, I know that FIP has noticed that the number of people who work in pharmacies and want to work in pharmacies is decreasing. 
Um, and that brings an issue in the situation where we have a fast aging population that uses more and more medication um, longer med uh, for a longer period of time medication. And we calculated that um, only in Europe, um, this um, approximately uh, causes 4 million patients to end up in a hospital due to avoidable mistakes on how to use uh, of, with their drugs. So they are not using the drug appropriately. Um, and with better uh, information, they um, well, the, the, the hospital visit and, and, and intake could have been avoided. Um, and then uh, last but not least, it's important to also say that patients um, expect to go more and more into the digital world. Um, and this means that in the future to keep the system sustainable, and we go to the next slide, um, the uh, solution uh, most probably is to go to a blended care model, a hybrid care model, a blended care model, where we say digital, if it's possible, because it is not possible for everybody, we know that. Um, if you have sight problems, if you have navigation problems, if you have no, uh, cognitive problems, health apps are not your solution. Um, but quite a significant uh, amount of, uh, uh, if, well, people already can work with digital. Um, and then uh, if we move that to the digital uh, support, um, there will be more time for the support of the professional pharmacists. So hybrid care is the way to keep the system sustainable in the future. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that the uh, figures um, about mobile adoption um, are supporting this. Uh, a principle, this concept, because quite a number of people in the world have a mobile or sometimes even more mobile phones, have access to, um, to a mobile and a, even a smarter application. And 83% of the population is able to at least work with a mobile. The smartphone adoption is a bit lower, but a, a phone, a mobile technology is um, a channel through which care uh, for many people can be very adequately provided. Um, please go to the next slide. Um, well, then it's interesting also uh, if you look at are people able to work with um, uh, health apps that, yeah, when you do a deep dive into the, to the uh, population characteristics, you can see that a growing number of elderly people is uh, able to work with it as well. So it's not about the age, it's not about, um, well, uh, a gender or something, uh, but um, yeah, uh, th th this growing amount of, of patients, what is important is that they are uh, enabled to make a choice in what is an adequate health app or not. And if you look at, um, this is an example of the Google Play Store, but you can also, oh, maybe go back to the next slide, yeah, uh, to the um, uh, iOS uh, store, the, the Apple App Store, you can see enormous amounts of uh, uh, applications related to health apps, um, and every now and then you see a fix uh, or a, or a uh, a heavy cleanup because they don't meet the requirements and I'm going to um, to explain you later what are requirements for health apps. But the, there is um, a growing uh, uh, awareness interest uh, and it's increasing every year uh, on the number of apps that support wellness that support um, uh, remote monitoring etc so it's an interesting amount 65,324 health apps only in the Google Play Store. Uh, next uh, slide, uh, please. So um, there are a number of uh, health app categories um, which we can see in general. Later, I will speak about which uh, applications are relevant for pharmacists. And um, their main uh, 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 focus or their main purpose is not to replace care. I think Rob was indicating that as well. It's not about replacing, it's augmenting the human, the professional care that we are currently um, uh, providing as pharmacists or as healthcare providers. But health apps can uh, support the clinical uh, uh, di and the diagnosis uh, part of the, of the patient support um, with AI, but also with uh, surveys, uh, remote, so that patients don't have to do that in the hospital. And they're basically, well, an, an assistant uh, which has a which a patient has every day in his, his or her pocket. Um, they support with remote monitoring. And um, I saw some nice pictures already uh, before, um, blood sampling, uh, all kinds of types of remote monitoring that make that patients don't go to the, um, the hospital uh, anymore if that is needed. 
they can use for clinical reference material. Uh, that's more the, the uh, professional support of, uh, of healthcare providers. Um, they also change the way logistics are um, organized in healthcare systems. Um, and this is something that if you introduce, and that's a personal experience as a founder of a start scale up, um, the implementation of a health app in a healthcare system is a really transforming, uh, is in, in many cases really a transformation of the model that we provide care. And that is not simple. It means that patients need uh, to, um, the patient journey change, patients need to do things differently, but also the pharmacy team and the interaction with uh, uh, healthcare, other healthcare providers changes. So it is not only implementing an application, but it's also thinking about how should we uh, reorganize the process in the most productive and effective way? And last but not least, uh, the prevention part, we need to prevent uh, as much as possible in order to um, uh, well prevent that people get ill or uh, end up in, in the more critical situations. Therefore, there are many wellness and healthy lifestyle app. Excuse me for the um, spelling mistakes at wellness. If we go to the next slide, um, then um, uh, the, these 65,342 uh, type of uh, health apps, um, what are the ones that separates the good from the great? Well, um, and this is where the value of a pharmacist comes in, because there are a number of elements that we as pharmacists need to understand before we can recommend using a health app by a patient or within our daily uh, uh, way of working. And a very interesting uh, example in this respect, uh, which recently, I think one and a half years ago, has been introduced by the ISO um, organization, so the International Standardization Organization, is the uh, formal um, uh, certification for health apps, which is ISO 80, uh, 82304. Uh, which you can see at the left side uh, of the screen. And basically um, that is a very understandable label for people because they can see this label on their washing machine or their uh, refrigerator or, and now uh, in the future you have, you have such a um, uh, nice visual graphic of your health app as well. It basically categorizes um, the, the, the security and the quality of the app in four fields, um, whether the app is healthy and safe and whether it meets the requirements of privacy or security, um, whether it's ready to use. And this is very important uh, in health application before patients are um, uh, starting needs to have instructions. If there is AI there need, uh, involved, uh, patients want to see uh, how that AI is built up and whether it's transparent, how decisions are made. So self-explanatory artificial intelligence is really something uh, very important in the future. Um, the, um, uh, there is an item that says, are the data uh, secured and transferred in a, in a safe way? And um, then uh, there is the, the, the last uh, part of, of the implementation uh, part. Well, basically this is a list of uh, by heart, I think 80 questions. Uh, also, um, well, uh, how, the company behind who is making it, is it, is it uh, in a solid way maintained, et cetera. And then you get a, a label and that label, of course, says something about how adequate you are, but also uh, where you can improve. And this ISO certification is formalized uh, in the mid of next year, uh, if I understand correctly. So they're now running a lot of tests uh, with, a, um, with, with the label and, and reviewing quite a number of apps. And I think it's a very interesting way of um, uh, proving whether a health application is safe or not. I know that there are also quite some other certification um, uh, uh, examples, but this is a, a very solid and structured one. Well, this and many other topics you can find, as Jaime mentioned in the introduction, um, in the second edition of the book, uh, Pharmaceutical Care and Digital Revolution. And it's uh, very great that the lead editor, uh, Adelan Mercier, a pharmacist uh, from Sydney, he is leading the um, updating of the book, uh, which currently is done by some 20 pharmaceutical or digital pharmaceutical care experts globally. Um, it's really an, um, well, I think a masterpiece uh, done by the many authors 
that describes um, uh, the importance of why we are need to need to move to a blended care model, um, meaning that uh, the ecosystem is uh, changing, but also that we need to uh, have an inclusive design for patients, etc. You will find a number of tools. The tools that I've heard. Uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, reality uh, chat GTP or conversational AI chatbots. Will we see ourselves in the future as a as a digital pharmacist? Um, machine learning described, uh, health apps described, and then uh, the importance of uh, how uh, successful you be in implementation. That's the compliance. That's um, how, as a pharmacist, you're educated and can help your patient with using type of health apps. And then, of course, there is a very important ethical part um, because not everybody is willing to share his or her data. And um, it's not always transparent uh, what kind of data the algorithm has used to come to a conclusion. And um, one of the other elements is uh, what if the uh, patient uh, uh, does not want uh, to work with a digital tool, but wants to see a pharmacist in, 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 a, in a blended care model. Um, I think those kind of ethical dilemmas, and there are many more, um, we as a professional educated uh, uh, group of, of healthcare providers have the opportunity and also the obligation in the future to help our patients to uh, give guidance on what is good and what is maybe less uh, preferred in, uh, in using uh, digitization. So that's all, all you can find that in the book. And then uh, it has been said already, the interoperability, which is very important as well. Um, so that means connecting systems. Uh, in the ideal world, if you introduce and make a new healthcare app, uh, the it's called an API first, an application programming interface. So um, don't develop the next uh, of this 65,000 health uh, healthcare apps as a, as a standalone application, but try to use standard uh, categorization methods uh, and make the data interoperable with the area, with the environment where the uh, patient is already ordering his medication, uh, doing his healthcare interactions, etc. So that's a very important point as well. Uh, please go to the next slide. Um, that leads me to one of the last slides being which uh, are the health applications that we are um, as a pharmacist most using currently. Well, we have uh, the apps that uh, help us to work smarter uh, in the logistics and in planning, etc but also the applications that go to more personalized care, offering the care that uh, the individual patient is expecting. Um, the improving of access, a very nice uh, example there is the, the digital human. So really the, the avatar um, that for a patient who cannot type, who cannot write, uh, who is really illiterate, can just open the uh, app, sees a human face and can ask, uh, can I uh, use milk with my medication? That's a very uh, that's really lowering the barrier of, for a patient of understanding how to use the drug appropriately, um, and that's uh, improving self management. It's better understanding how to use uh, the the drug uh, appropriately, um, and to increase the value of the healthcare that we are giving. Because of timing, I'm going to the next slide. Please go to the next slide. Yeah, and that was my uh, my key takeaway message. Um, I think we really need to create as as healthcare providers in general a single point of health through for the uh, patient. So a single point of care, but also a single point of health through. All the um, buzz about the GPT tools, it's not only chat GPT, but there are more. It's really fantastic what that tool can take, but it is not yet reliable. And um, we as a pharmacist should make sure that people can trust the information that they get via health app. Uh, and that's, I think, one of, the one of our most uh, duties, most important duties to do in the next years to come. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you, Claudia, uh, for, uh, again, a very inspiring and realistic uh, presentation. I think it was very good. Thank you so much. So we move on now to our next spe speaker. Uh, I would kindly um, ask our speakers uh, 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 to try to stick to the, to the time. We're getting a little bit tight. So thank you for that. So it's time now for Natasha Jovanovic-Jeskovic. 
uh, who is the, the Dean of the Faculty of Pharmacy in Serbia in Novi Sad. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jaime. I'm really happy that I'm here today because we are discussing very important topic, uh, digital health and digital pharmacy. Uh, and it's uh, important, it's exciting time. Uh, and of course, uh, we uh, there are a lot of to do, but also we have to have a um, digital enabled pharmacist and right mindset to accept uh, all these possibilities and to implement them in the daily practice. Um, so I will today uh, dealing a bit, I will deal today uh, with the education, digitalization of education, etc. Next slide, please. Well, when we're talking about digital education, primarily we're thinking about using different technologies uh, and tools in the education process. And of course, we have uh, a lot of lessons learned from the last few years, so from the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, uh, we saw how important uh, it was and still is to use the, the, the digital technology to enable continuity in a, in a learning process, in a teaching process. And here I'm referring to my dear colleague, Professor Alke Mantel from Utrecht University, Netherlands. And I'm uh, actually stating her sentence, without digital education, we would have faced immense delays in educating the necessary workforce. So it's clear how important it was to, to use uh, digital edu education. But also it is important to realize, and I will try to address this, that in my presentation is uh, that uh, if we want to implement digital health and principle of digital health, which is, as we heard, one of the development goals, uh, we uh, need to, uh, uh, to educate our pharmacists and uh, to start preparing them to use different tools already during, during education. So trying to change, as I mentioned, mindset of, of a pharmacist, future pharmacist. Um, next slide. Well, uh, just shortly, briefly, what we learned uh, during COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, first lesson is that uh, we realized how important, important was to use different technologies uh, because it, it enabled us continuity in teaching process. We use different platforms, we use better platform in uh, online tools uh, for various uh, teaching interaction. Uh, it was much easier to organize international classrooms, uh, meetings, etc. Uh, there are students that are benefit from online education that are feeling more comfortable to express themselves in online environment. But of course, some of the activities remain difficult, like uh, lab work, practicals, um, um, activities within the clinics, assessments, etc. And uh, one thing uh, which we uh, shouldn't forget, and that is the teaching is a social process. And uh, we had to find a way to keep it social uh, uh, also online. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you could hear from my dear colleagues today uh, about different technologies, uh, different tools that are used in to in providing health care. Um, the same holds for, for, for digital education. So there are different uh, possibilities, different technologies that can be used in providing education itself. Uh, uh, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into detail. So I would just refer to the study of McKinsey and Company uh, where they uh, investigated um, uh, mo the most common use technologies to um, uh, establish a group work, uh, con connectivity, team building, uh, how to use augmented virtual reality, artificial inter intelligence, how to monitor student progress, classroom interaction, classroom exercises, etc. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so there are a lot of technologies and um, uh, these technology were adopted during pandemic um, to enable continu continuity in teaching process and they were embraced by majority of students. They found it efficient and also more entertaining way of learning, but we still don't see that broad use of technologies in education itself. 
Next slide. Why is that? Well, there are several reasons. Again, I'm referring to a study of, of McKinsey Group. Uh, there are several reasons why we don't have um, a high um, level in the implementation of, of uh, digital learning tools uh, in, in uh, education process. And one of the main reasons or the, the top reason is actually lack of awareness. So still, even after these few years, uh, we have significant percentage of uh, faculty members of students that are not aware of, of technologies or the potential of the technologies. Next slide, please. I wanted also to show you here uh, the results which we obtained uh, from our survey among, survey among the pharmacies. So we're not talking about the students, we're talking about the pharmacies in daily practice. Uh, and there, uh, we wanted to have a feeling after COVID uh, about the uh, uh, openness to new technology, to digital, uh, how familiar they are with the various tools, with telepharmacy. And um, again, we have a, a similar issue like in education. Uh, the main reason why they are not using um, tools and telepharmacy uh, or, or potential is a, a lack of information. So major, majority of them were just um, not having enough trainings or proper trainings uh, on this subject. And that's the reason why, if you look at the right side of the uh, of the slide, uh, seventy four percent of them were still in favor of going face to face and not some uh, using uh, telepharmacy or telemedicine uh, as an option to communicate with the with the patient. So next slide, please. Uh, so, well, what are the considerations for the future? Well, as we could see. Uh, among the uh, universities and among the, uh, the pharmacies, we have the same issue, and that's that we need to educate, to train, and to update people with, with the proper information uh, about um, digital health as a topic and a digital tools uh, as, a, as a potential for, for the education. So that's one thing, but also we have to be aware that we are living in not equal world so not everyone has an access to internet to a computer so even if you're talking about digitalization of education and also digitalization of pharmaceutical uh, healthcare uh, one of the main questions remains how to ensure and maintain equity uh, also i uh, wanted to share my impression during covid uh, and use by while i was using various tools Sometimes too many can be too much because we have uh, many available technologies and tools and we are talking about fast changing uh, uh, field of IT. So that means if I'm using something now uh, to uh, improve my teaching process or to improve my healthcare uh, service, uh, after half a year of a, a, a year, one year, that will be outdated. So I have to uh, keep up with my own profession, but also with novelties in the in the in this field, and to have a good backup in training. So that's really, I think, really important to realize when we are discussing about this this topic, and also. Um, uh, we should discuss what are the best models. There are different possibilities, hybrid teaching versus blended smart mix of face-to-face -face and virtual. Uh, experience of our team here in, in the Novi Sad is that we prefer, prefer either to have all students online or all students in the classroom, uh, because when you talk about um, hybrid, so that part of the students are online and part of the students are in the classroom, uh, then you have a feeling when you're addressing people uh, in the classroom that you're neglecting people who are online and vice versa. So at least that's a personal impression. So that's something what we could share, discuss, improve. And uh, therefore it's important to discuss, to talk, to exchange best, pra best practice practices uh, to share our resources. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so coming back to my uh, first question is, is it digital education the first step in development of the digitally enabled pharmacists? 
Uh, yes, I, I would say yes. And I would say that digitalization and digital transformation of our profession uh, starts with education. Because if we keep on learning in old fashioned way uh, and we exclude all uh, new tools, we cannot expect from the future pharmacies to be open enough to um, technical innovation, to IT, to, to digital options. So we should start from the very beginning. Uh, we should actually embrace technology uh, from the beginning of um, development of future pharmacies from the root, and that's his or her education. So we have to start from education. And I, I will show next, please. Uh, I will show you a picture, which is actually a picture of our um, curriculum. Uh, what we did here in Serbia, and, you know, is that we renewed our curriculum three years ago, and we made an interactive curriculum, uh, and that's how we are promoting a pharmacy to future students. So we are talking about the roots um, with different branches. Uh, I'm sorry, it's in, in Serbian, but uh, for example, Aishu, can you please just point out at any branch and I will explain shortly. Branch, root, root, sorry, not below, in the root of, uh, oh, back, yeah, there. For example, uh, every, it's a, there are different fields uh, that are being uh, taught in pharmacy. Here we're talking about uh, health, uh, food, and pharmacy. And when we click it, because this is a picture, but interactive, when we click on that branch, uh, we have a list of subjects that were taught that are taught about in this field. We also have pharmacy and chemistry, and then we are having chemical uh, subjects, etc. We also have uh, digital pharmacy as one of the subjects. So what I'm trying to say here, it's very important to uh, innovate the curriculum, so to create a good route so that the tree is a pharmacist of 21st centuries and in the tree above every leaf represent the field where pharmacies can work uh, so that's uh, that is from the industry uh, regulatory hospital toxicology pharmacoeconomy etc etc uh, but from the root we have to be innovative uh, in the way we are teaching so implementing digital tools uh, in, uh, in in the teaching methodology and also with the subjects we are uh, we are teaching so implementing new subjects uh, like uh, for example digital pharmacy or biotech medicines etc uh, etc et so that pharmacies are equipped with right, good basis for 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 the for the market uh, of, of 21st uh, for the job market of 21st century um next slide please with this, I'm uh, ending my short uh, presentation. Um, yeah, digital transformation of pharmaceutical care starts with education. And it's really good that FIP is supporting this. Uh, Jaime showed that in his presentation that there are different surveys, uh, reports, uh, trainings that are uh, helping colleagues all over the world to get, uh, to get involved in this field. As you could, you could have heard, uh, digital health is one of the developing goals. And again, I will um, address the, the course um, that we developed a year ago, Train the Trainer, that is, uh, that is also a giving uh, a basic of digital pharmacy, digital health. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, <clears throat> Natasha, for an excellent overview of pharmacy education and technology. Uh, it's time now for uh, a pleasure to introduce you to uh, Whitley G, uh, who's a member of the FIP Technology Advisory Group. Uh, she works at the University of Colorado in the USA. And I must say that I enjoyed very much her presentation in the FIP Stabil Conference about artificial intelligence. She masters artificial intelligence and that's the way she delivers uh, the information, very simple, uh, but the only way that uh, masters in, uh, in, uh, in an area uh, can do. So thank you Whitley, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jaime. I am super excited to get to talk with everyone today about artificial intelligence. As you may have noticed, like almost every speaker today has touched on AI, and that's because it's becoming increasingly difficult to talk about the future of healthcare without talking about artificial intelligence. 
It is one of our greatest tools to transform how care de is delivered. But like any tool, its benefit is going to depend on how we use it and having the right people involved in its development. So before I begin, I think it's always helpful to just quickly talk about what is artificial intelligence. And so artificial intelligence is the broad umbrella term that really refers to anything that mimics human intelligence. And within that, we have our terms machine learning and then further categorized into deep learning. Next slide. So with machine learning, it's really a spectrum. It's not a yes or no question. This is when we have algorithms or models that are able to look at data and recognize patterns and then apply that to new data it's never seen before. And so in the far left, you see that we have our statistical modeling and analytics. And then as you go further to the right is when we start going into deep learning or our neural networks. And this is when humans do less of the work and it's more of the machine that's determining what it's learning and how it's learning. Next slide. And so our deep neural networks, which is what we're going to, which most of this talk will focus on deep learning specifically, it is modeled after the our biological neurons. So it's really modeled after the human brain and how it works. We have our computational neurons that are similar to our biological neurons, where we take the summation of all the data puts that go into it, and then based on some function, it's the summation of all of those both inhibitory and excitatory signals that then determines whether that neuron fires and then signals the neuron next in line in that network. And we can then put many of these computational neurons together and put them in different layers to ideally mimic how the human brain also learns. Next slide. So when we put these all together in layers, we have our deep neural networks. And this is just a quick visualization, which I think is helpful to understand how these learn. And they learn a way we call represent representational learning. So each layer in the network is going to continuously build on what the previous layer recognized or learned. So if you're trying to recognize an image, the very first layer may only be able to recognize very simple shapes or colors or gradients. And then the next layer learns combinations of those simple shapes that the first one did. And then you keep building on that until you get to increasing complexity by the final layer and are able to recognizing, recognize something as complex as a dog or even a specific breed of dog. Next slide. So with that, let's, I wanna dive into some of the challenges and opportunities then for applying these deep learning algorithms in medication management. So when we think about AI applications in pharmacy, we already have many examples of how AI is applied both across research and practice. So it's been used in drug discovery, drug repurposing, and we also see it involved in diagnosis, data collection, workflow, like inventory management. Where we don't see a lot of applications yet is when we look at actual medication management. So therapy intervention recommendations and actual triage versus prediction, and this is what I kind of want to dive into is now looking at medication management. Next slide. So is AI healthcare possible? So let's explore that. Next slide, please. So we're going to dive into some of these limitations. So I think learning the way or the, the ideal place of AI really understands or really comes down to understanding what are its limitations and how we can apply it. Next slide. So we think about our algorithmic limitations, one of the biggest challenges we have in healthcare is what we call model drift. This happens when a the environment that a model was trained on is continuously changing in such a way that the performance of the model starts degrading over time. This means that the signals that a model was looking at are no longer true to the current data that it's looking at now. So in healthcare, for instance, you have continuously, we are constantly changing both healthcare practice and recommendations, but also what um, new medications are coming out all the time as well. So the environment is constantly changing, which means that we have to constantly be retraining our models to take into account this new information if we want the models to still perform at the same level of accuracy. As an example, next slide. We, um, one of the things that have been talked about lately is 
chat GPT. So GPT-3 is the model that that was based on. And because this was published in 2020, it was published before medications like Paxlovid came to market. So of course, when you ask the model, what is Paxlovid? It actually will tell you that it's an antipsychotic medication instead of telling you that it is an antiviral medication used to treat COVID-19. And this is important because we have to be able to think about how do we create how do we create standards around this and guardrails to know when a medic when a model is up to date and how often we need to retrain it. Next slide. So we also have to think about bias. And I know Paul talked on this a little bit, um, mentioning the important uh, and risk that bias can play in these models. So I think we, a lot of us are familiar with some of the common examples that where we know that by where models can be biased in performance and be less accurate when it comes to um, certain racial groups, for example, when looking at image recognition. But there's also a lot of other subtler ways that models can be biased too that we need to be aware of. Next slide. So if we say we wanted to build a model that actually, that helps with patient self-efficacy and health literacy. So if we build a model that would tell a patient what questions they should ask their pharmacist when starting a new medication, we can, we can do that. And so in this example, using chat GPT-3, we asked, I asked it like, what are the most important questions that a patient should ask? The model actually will give different results depending on whether you specify a female or a male patient. Next slide. So if you actually, so for the male patient, the model will actually focus on things such as cost or tactical questions, like do I need a prescription? The model also gave fewer questions to men than it did to women. And you can imagine that this could, even though it seems fairly simple, this could have downstream implications where if patients are asking different questions, that mean they're also learning different information and potentially creating inequity in the health outcomes based on what patients are learning. Next slide. And lastly, wanted to touch on black box algorithms. So this is important because we don't always know what our models are, are learning. So it's not just what our models learn, but we have to understand how they learn it. And for black box models, it means that in this, the example that I had previously, this is a model that when you, when they're trying to train it on recognizing, um, recognizing chest x-rays, the model, they use data that had been pre-annotated and the model was actually not picking up anything about the chest x-ray itself. It was actually recognizing whether there was text on the image or not to say whether the chest x-ray was normal ab or abnormal. Um, so then another important challenge we have is lack of sufficient AI expertise. And this is because we need pharmacists involved in the entire life cycle of developing and deploying models so that we know that we're applying it to the right problems. Next slide. In this example, this was a study that looked at innovative models created for medication management in critical care. However, likely this is what can happen when we don't have medication experts involved in development of these models. If you look at the, the study or the data that these models were trained on, over 70% of the studies use training data sets that did not include complete medication data. And so knowing that, would you trust any of these models? Next slide. Lastly, one of our greatest challenges is really understanding what are the right problems to be applying each AI model to. And so within our current AI toolkit, there's a lot of different types of models and algorithms. And so I wanna focus now on natural language because there's been a lot of current news around NLP. Next slide. This just gives a very quick summary of just some of the headlines around how NLP is being used in healthcare. And everything from recognizing illness to helping predict outbreaks to even detect detecting suicide risk um, from social media posts. Next slide. And lastly, as I believe um, it was already 
mentioned previously, one of the biggest kind of disruptors that we had coming out was ChatGPT, which was released by OpenAI. And this was based on the GPT-3 language model, which, had a hundred, which has 175 billion parameters and was trained on over 410 billion tokens, which are essentially words. And this is, it's really, it's basically trained on the entire history of the internet. And it can create text indistinguishable from human generated text. Next slide. And this is so advanced, that I think as it, it, it was mentioned, it has, without any additional training, ChatGPT has that passed the US medical licensing exams. We also start, we are seeing it actually being listed as primary authors for um, research publications. So what does this mean? Is chat GPT, uh, chat GPT ready to start taking on healthcare? Next slide. So this gives just a kind of a slight illustration of how our language models have evolved. So you can see as we add on more and more data, we start being able to do new tasks. So initially we could do some simple question answering, then we get into ability to actually understand language and do summarization. And then finally, with our very large language models, we actually get into logical inference chains, um, being able to actually explain what a joke is, creating proverbs, doing semantic parsing. Next slide. However, not all language models are created equal. And we, what we will see is that there's usually less pharmacy and medication data represented in the training data that these models are trained on, which means that there's a potential for lower, lower accuracy with medication-related tasks compared to other clinical tasks. Next slide. So can we actually solve this with enough data? We've seen extreme um, leaps and bounds in capabilities in our large language model by adding more and more data. So can we resolve the issue of inaccurate pharmacy and medication knowledge? Next slide. So here's an example of chat GPT-3 answering information about a medication and whether it has certain effects. So if we ask if nortriptyline has anticholinergic effects, it answers correctly. So you see below, those are like the clinical warnings for nortriptyline that to avoid use in the elderly because of its cholinergic and sedating effects, uh, sedating effects. So this is the um, earlier version of chat GPT. So go to next slide, please. So then we took GPT-3 and trained it with more data. And then the next evolution was chat GPT. What you realize, however, is that it actually became worse in answering this medication knowledge question. And so chat GPT will actually tell you that nor, um, nortriptyline does not have anticholinergic effects. And it does so in a way that appears very credible, but is inaccurate. Next slide. Why is this the case? This is because these large language models are just probabilistic word generators. They are not actually learning facts or knowledge. They are really learning a probabilistic understanding or statistical representation of language and common, the most common collective understanding, general understanding of information based on what is available online. So you can imagine what these models are learning from is all of the information that is open source or consumer facing on the internet. Usually we don't tend to see words like anticholinergic in consumer facing information. And so as we start training these models with more and more information, we start drowning out some of the other specific um, pharmacy use cases. And so another way to think about it, if you were um, around probabilistic word generation or generative AI for image recognition, the way that this works is that if you were to block out a part of an image or take out a part of an image, the AI will then recreate what should be there or what it thinks should be there based on what the surrounding pixels are. And so our large language models do the same thing. So it's not that they know information, but they are predicting or creating a general estimate of what words they think should be 
should be um, should be said based on what the surrounding words or context is. So in the case of pharmacy, more data is not necessarily always better. Next slide. So finally, to wrap up, I'm trying to do this fairly quickly, um, it is important for us to understand both the capabilities and limitations so that we know how to apply AI as clinicians in a way that is both safe but promotes health outcomes. Next slide. So lastly, just to wrap up, it is very important that we have pharmacists and medication experts involved in the entire life cycle of AI. In order to make it work, work for us, we have to be a part of building it. Next slide. So thank you all very much and time it back to you. Thank you, Willie. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation as always, uh, very interesting. I've suffered myself the inaccuracy of chat GPT, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, unfortunately, we do not have time for uh, questions and answers. We've run out of time. So now over to Lars Oke for summary and, and conclusions. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Jaime. And thank you uh, all uh, of our experts today. A most fascinating session, I would say. And of course, uh, I, I thank all of you for staying with us, although it's over time. But this is what happens when we cover such an important and interesting event as how digital health is changing care delivery for pharmacists and improving uh, public health. So I think it's both clear and evident that uh, the digital transformation impacts healthcare through technology. And telepharmacy and, uh, and digital tools are set to become one of the most important aspects of, of medicine in the years to come. And the ability to provide patients with increased and more timely access to pharmaceutical care, reduce costs for individuals and health systems, and improve patient satisfaction, experience and convenience, and of course, better health outcomes. So technology allows pharmacists to do more uh, purpose-driven, patient-centered work, uh, and by using these digital tools, we can help drive clinical outcomes and prioritize outreach to patients who need additional support in managing their uh, medications. And technologies such as robotics, automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence will also help power our approach to dynamic workload sharing where certain parts of pharmacy workflow can be completed virtually and where pharmacies can have more direct interaction with patients and where we can serve our patients where and when they need us at the most. So the future of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences is digital and it is exciting. And a digitally enabled and agile pharmaceutical workforce will capitalize on the benefits of digital health to serve the higher purpose of providing good health and well-being for all uh, and uh, leaving no one behind. Um, uh, I encourage you to uh, join us at the FIP Congress in Brisbane, where we will have a digital summit um, for pharmacists, but where we also will have many, many sessions, very attractive sessions in the program that will be highlighted within a couple of weeks at our webpage. So stay tuned. And the digital transformation we have experienced in many facets of our lives, from banking to shopping to entertainment, has now gained momentum in healthcare and pharmacy practice models are being re-envisioned and pharmacy team member roles are increasingly being positioned to realize our full potential. So pharmacies can actually leverage technology for health promotion, disease prevention, and medication optimization efforts as we evolve to offer omnichannel access, a continuum of in-person and virtual care based on the type of service and patient preference. So join us in Brisbane to explore the rapid advances at the intersection of healthcare and technology and consider how you can transform your practice and your role in a digitally enabled care. 
As such, I would like to thank our fantastic panelists uh, for their most valuable presentations, for sharing their experience and wisdom with us, and for showing us the path to the future. Thank you so very much for your contribution. And also thank you to the FIP project team, the digital events team at our headquarters for excellent support. And thank you, Jaime, for co-chairing this uh, event with me today. It's always a pleasure to work with you. And stay tuned for future FIP digital events here. And thank you so very much, all of you, for attending. And I look forward to meeting you all in Brisbane. Thank you so very much, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.